Uh, when I preach, I want you to understand I don't preach at anybody ever. I preach to me because I preach what I feel like God is trying to tell me. And I hope that through what God is trying to tell me, God will then speak to you. Because I don't want to ever be that type of preacher who comes down and point my finger at you and saying, this is how you got to get your life together. Because that's not my job. My job is just to proclaim to you what God is doing in my life as a witness to what God wants to hopefully do in your life. And so here the lesson from Luke chapter 17. On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were all cleansed. One of them went and he saw that he was healed came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? No one has returned to give praise to God except the foreigner. Then he said to them, rise, go. Your faith has made you well. Here ends the lesson. I want to start with a little bit of context. Remember, we've been talking for the last, like, I don't know, 50 months. It just feels that way. About this dinner that has taken place where Jesus was having this conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees. Guess what? Today we're not no longer at the dinner. Okay, big cheer. Woo! We're, the dinner's over. Jesus is out of this place. He's now walking away from this town. And it says in the Bible he's walking between... Uh, he's, uh, walk, he's walking between uh, two different towns, and we're going to get back to that in a minute. So that faithful dinner is over, but this dinner is under, you must understand that this dinner was central to understanding what would happen next, because Jesus is about to be killed. It's the reason why Jesus was killed, because of the conflict that Jesus had with the religious leadership at this dinner. They were pretty ticked off with Jesus at this point, and they were looking for an opportunity to murder him, because he was... Again, speaking against their use of power to benefit themselves. So he's a harsh critic of the religious establishment. And now we're told in the Bible he's heading towards Jerusalem. And it mentions Jerusalem very intentionally in the passage of Scripture that we read today. Because we as Christians know what that foreshadows, don't we? That Jesus was going to Jerusalem to do what? To die for crucifixion. So it's kind of like a foreshadowing of what's going to happen. We know what's going to take place. Here's the other key about this. Jesus knows what's about to take place to him as well. And so Jesus is between Samaria and Galilee. And it says in the Bible that he starts crisscrossing back and forth. You kind of follow his pattern. And he's, he's heading towards Jerusalem, but he's in no great rush either. He's got to take a little bit more time to train his disciples. And after all, if you're a man that had a death sentence on your head, would you kind of take your time to go to your executioner? So he's kind of taking his time, winding his way through Galilee and Samaria, and working as an itinerant preacher. And again, the Bible says he's just doing this casual journey on the way to Jerusalem. But, make no mistake, he knows his journey is going to end in Jerusalem. And so that's what this is about. Now, on that journey, Jesus runs into ten lepers. And I love this story because it's such a powerful story. Now, a little bit about leprosy. Now, we know that there is a particular diagnosis of leprosy in our modern journals today of medicine and that specifies what leprosy is. But that wasn't what leprosy was back then. Now, yeah, it kind of was in some cases, but leprosy in their day referred to a whole variety of physical ailments. It could be to cancer. If you have skin cancer and you start getting a blob on your arm, they would consider that leprosy. If you had really bad acne, that might be considered leprosy. I feel really bad for teenagers, okay? Uh, if you have some type of rash, if you're like, uh, like my, my, my wife who gets uh, poison ivy really easily, or poison oak, and you just get it all over your body, that would have been considered leprosy at that time. And so what would happen to lepers? Lepers were people that were cast out of their communities and were forced to live in these rural areas out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so a leper colony was a place where the lepers shared their misery out in the middle of nowhere. And what would happen is if, if you had a family member who had leprosy, you would maybe, if you loved them, you would bring some food out to them, maybe some leftover meat or maybe some leftover bread or 
some leftover this from your meal from the night before, and you would leave it at a designated place where you drop it off and then you run away because after all, you don't want to get whatever it is that they have. But that's how these folks lived. And so they shared this type of misery in this type of place. A leper colony was also a mixed colony, racially diverse, religiously diverse, because when you are a leper, you don't care about who the person is standing next to you, you just need that support. Let me use an illustration of this. I actually met a nun, and uh, she was a missionary to Nigeria. Now, you may not know a lot about Nigeria, but let me tell you, like, Nigeria is one of the more dangerous places in the world to live right now because there's such conflict between, um, between the, uh, the political establishment and radical uh, Islamic terrorists who are coming in and just trying to destroy and tear down the country. And it's just a very dangerous place to live. If you're a Christian, you're, you know, they'll come into your village and just execute hundreds of Christians at the time. It, it, we don't hear about it much because our, our attention is in a lot of other places in the world. But it's a dangerous place to live. And so one of the, the sad things is she said, when I'm, she's a nun, she's a Catholic nun. She said, when I'm walking on the streets in the United States of America, and I walk by a Baptist church or an Assemblies of God church, they want to put me straight and tell me how I'm going to hell. Okay? She said, all of a sudden, I already am a missionary in Nigeria, and the bullets start flying. Guess who's sitting beside me holding my hand and praying to Jesus? Oh, that's right, a missionary from the Assemblies of God Church and from a Baptist church. And we don't care what denomination we are when the bullets start flying. Isn't that the way it should be? But that's the way it is in this leper colony. They're no longer asking, what religion are you? Are you truly faithful? Are you the right racial mix? Or are you like one of those dog Samaritans? Nobody cares whether you're a Samaritan or a Jew or a Gentile when you're in desperate need. You just help each other. And so that's the context here. So Jesus sees these ten lepers. And it says in the Bible they kept their distance. But they asked and begged Jesus to heal them. And what Jesus did, now it's very particular. The Bible says that they were cleansed. It doesn't say that they were healed. We're going to come back to the minute why it says that. It's a very, this is not a semantic difference. It's, a, there, it just, it's not the same thing as saying big or large, okay? It's not the difference between being cleansed and healed. There's a very specific difference between being cleansed and being healed, and Jesus wants to point this out to us in our lesson for today. So like I said, the Bible doesn't say that they were healed because healing has a lot more to do than just getting your body cured of whatever ailment that you might struggle with. You can be cured of cancer, but not healed. You can be cured of some other malady, but not healed. Because healing is more than just the curing of some type of physical ailment. Now notice what Jesus tells them. They're cured of their physical ailment, not healed. But he tells them, go and show yourselves to the priests. Which was in keeping with the law, of pure, the purity laws of the Jews. Okay? The priest was the one who would determine whether or not you'd be welcome back in the community. This is why we know a lot of leprosy was just maybe a rash or some type of skin problem that you might have. And once that clears up, you're welcome to go back to your priest. Your priest looks at your arm and you no longer have that, that thing, that, that skin problem that you had. You'd be welcome back in the community. You can turn over to the next page. But here's what happens. All ten of them are cured of their physical ailments. Ten go walking away, but one of the ten looks down and says... Huh, my body's cured. What does the Bible say that he does? He says he notices that he's healed. He turns around and he comes back and gives thanks to Jesus. Why is he healed? The other nine are cured, but they're not healed. What's the distinction that Luke is trying to make here? And it has to do with that word gratitude. One leper returned to say thank you to Jesus. He was the one that was truly healed. Here's the amazing thing. What national island was he again? A Samaritan. That is really significant. Wasn't a Jew. It wasn't a Gentile. It was a Samaritan. In the Jewish way of thinking, there are three brands of people. You had the Jews, who are up here next to God. 
you have the Gentiles down here, slime of the earth. Oh, and then you have the dogs, the Samaritans, who were the worst of all because they were half-breeds. They were half-Jewish, half-Gentile, and that just could not be tolerated. And so the Jews hated, despised the Samaritans. The Jews, again, who had the blessing of God and had the many blessings and knew God, unlike the Samaritan, did not come back to give thanks to Jesus. So, and the reason for that is because it's so easy when you grow up surrounded by the blessings of God to take it for granted. And that's what I think these Jews did. They just kind of took it for granted, their, their health, their well-being, the gifts of God, and they just didn't even think about saying thank you. Now, I'm going to ask you, you don't have to answer it. I don't want to, I don't want to wave, wave a hand or anything. I just want you to think in your head, how many of you have had a really crappy week this week? Okay. I want you to think real quick of all those terrible things that took place. I want you to think of that fender bender that you're just in. I want you to think of that bad news that you just got. We know we have people in our church who lost their jobs. We have people who've lost part of their homes because they're, they're, they're in Florida and, and uh, their homes got washed away or, or, or really got beaten up from the storm and so forth, okay? So, yeah, it's a crummy week, right, for some of you. But now, I want to show you something. I want you to close your eyes. Just deal with me for a minute with this. Including those of you watching at home. I just want you to close your eyes for a minute. And I want to, as quiet as we can make it, I just want you to breathe in, breathe out. Do it again. Breathe in. Feel yourself breathing in. Taking that oxygen into your lungs. Let it out nice and slow. Now what I want you to do is find your heartbeat. Put your hand on your chest, on your neck, on your wrist, whatever. Just feel your heart beating a second. And just feel your heartbeat and feel yourself breathing in, breathing out. Just, just take a second just to feel that. You feel that? 30,000 times a day, your heart beats and you breathe in and breathe out. 30,000 times a day. And yet you're still upset about the guy who flipped you off the other day, who cut you off in traffic. You're still upset about that little fender bender you're in, even though your family's healthy, well, and safe. And yet every single day, God has given you 30,000 blessings. The older you get, any time you've had any problems with your blessing, that, my wife and I both have had lung clots, you start to appreciate a little bit more of those breaths that you take into your lungs. Maybe you know people who've had heart disease or had a heart attack. You start to appreciate a little bit more those heartbeats, don't you? But every single one of them is a blessing from God, and we're sitting here focused on that one bad thing that happened today, when today, amidst that one bad thing that happened, you have 30,000 blessings. You get what I'm saying? You are truly blessed by God. And you take it for granted. I want you to make sure you take every day the opportunity as you breathe in, breathe out, feel your heartbeat, and say, oh, I'm not owed that. My heart were to stop right now. I were to stop breathing. I will have been lived a very blessed life because I'm not owed one more breath and one more beat of that heart. we got to stop taking for granted the blessings that God has given us. Let me share this in another illustration, another way. That was the problem that the Jewish religious leaders had. They just thought they were all this in a bag of chips, as you remember J.D. as he would say it, right? You know, they just thought they were so blessed by God. They just, or they just thought... They were owed the blessings that they received from God. They didn't realize the great gifts that God had given them. They took it for granted. And it reminds me of being on our sabbatical several years ago, Ella, Chris, and I. The last stop that we made, well, the next to the last stop, no, the last stop we made was in San Francisco. San Francisco is a great town. If you've not had the opportunity to be in San Francisco, I love San Francisco. It's a great city, a lot of fun, great food, very colorful, very diverse city. 
lots of great things. You see some of the most amazing patriotic things. You see some of the most horrendous poverty. Uh, it, in fact, on the lawn at the, at the, uh, the courthouse or the uh, city uh, building there, uh, uh, the building there for the city of uh, San Francisco, the, the uh, official building. What am I thinking of? The Capitol. Not the Capitol. Whatever it is in San Francisco. Whatever. They have, there are literally hundreds, hundreds of homeless people. Hundreds of homeless people that sleep there. All over the city. You would just not believe. We see one or two here and there on the streets of Pittsburgh. Hundreds of homeless, of pe homeless people in San Francisco. So, I mean, you see extreme wealth, extreme poverty, all congregated in one area. But the other thing you see is extreme patriotism and extreme anti-Americanism in uh, San Francisco too. And so this is part of the story. I remember being on the, uh, you know, we, we went down to the uh, shore there and we're just walking uh, along, the, you know, along the shore and so forth. And uh, there was this guy, 90 plus year old guy, had his World War II hat on, World War II veteran. And I love veterans. I'm going to tell you, I love veterans of this country. My family, my uncle fought in Vietnam. My dad was a, a fighter pilot. I had uh, um, I had 16, 17, I think my mom counted 17 members of my family fought in the Civil War. I had seven of my family members fight in the Revolutionary War. My family's been in this country for a long time. We got a stake in this country. My family served very proudly in the military of this country, okay? I haven't though. So when I see somebody who served, and I haven't, I'm very grateful for what they've done. And so I saw this 90 plus year old man who had served in World War II. These guys are getting old, by the way. You see somebody with a World War II huh, hat on, you better thank them now because you might not get another chance. Because they're all 94, 95 right now. That's the youngest of the actual guys who actually fought in World War II. You might have 92 year olds who fought, who were there in the occupation, but these guys are 94, 95, and they're going quick. So I went up and I, and I grabbed his hand. My daughter will tell you I like to do this all the time. I'll go up and, and shake the hand of the guy. If I see a hat on, I'll say, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for your service. This guy started crying because he appreciated very much that somebody took the time to acknowledge his sacrifice. But there was a woman sitting over you know, at another table where we're at, and she and, and a little girl, eight year old or so, nine year old, I don't remember, she looked up at her mom and said, What is that guy doing? And the mom said, I don't know, I guess the guy fought in World War II, I guess. I don't get it, it's stupid. I'm like, Are you kidding me? I'm sitting here giving thanks to a veteran, and this woman thinks it's stupid that I'm giving thanks to this veteran for his service to our country. It is a lack of gratitude because this man sacrificed so that we might be free. You get what I'm saying here? This is what we need to do realize in our lives. Not take for granted the blessings of God that far outstrip even what our veterans have done for this country. What God has done for you is just amazing. So like I said, let's go on and finish this up. As I mentioned to you, verse 9, 19 says, Only one of the ten lepers was truly healed. The Bible indicates, as I said, it was a Samaritan. and the, He was grateful. The one who was grateful, he was made well. And what I learned from this story is that one can be cured physically, but there's more than that to true healing. Because for true healing to take place, what really needs to be changed is our attitudes. That's what God wants to really transform, is your attitude tonight. I'm not pointing at anybody. I realize it came over this way. I'm not pointing at any of you. Like, lack of gratitude over there. No, I'm not pointing at you. I'm pointing at me. How's that? It's my attitude. i got to change my attitude. And that's what God wants to do to bring me true healing. So this is what I learned. And this is where the rubber hits the road. The number one thing I learned from our lesson for today is that Jesus is merciful to social outcasts. I love the Gospel of Luke. When you compare it to the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, for instance, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, you know, Luke has Jesus saying, blessed are the poor, the social outcasts, the people who don't have enough money to put on their table, food on the table for today. Luke has Jesus being 
overwhelmingly concerned about the financial and, uh, and, and financial heartaches and the hard times through which people are going. So he is very concerned about the social outcasts. God's grace, we are told, is not limited to a narrow club of the in crowd, okay? The second thing I think that we learned from our lesson, and this is where, oh, it gets really exciting here. Jesus expects the lepers to conform to Jewish norms and show themselves to the priests, which proves to me something else. All those people that want to use Jesus to prove their politics are right, you know, get behind me, Satan. This is what you're going to hear from me in this political season and in this election season. I don't give a crap about either one of these parties. I'm just telling you, because none of you are of Jesus. Okay? There is no ism, no political system, not socialism, not communism, not capitalism, not Democrats, not Republicans. None of you all represent Jesus Christ. Sorry to say it, but I'm telling you, there's only one politics in the Bible. And here, I'm going to tell you what the politics are of the Bible. In the kingdom of heaven, there is a throne. In the kingdom of heaven, Jesus sits on the throne. From that throne flows out living water, which everybody can drink from it and receive new life, be nourished, and filled with the love of God. There's only one law in the kingdom of heaven. You know what that law is? Love. It's not written down anywhere except in your heart. There's no police force, no guns to enforce you to keep the law of love. There is no uh, police station. There's, there's, there's nobody is arrested in the kingdom of heaven. There's no jail cells. There's no military to force their way upon you. It is all about Jesus. You show me any political system that has Jesus sitting in the throne and one law, no police force, no guns, and I'll follow it. But otherwise, don't tell me your politics is of Jesus, because it isn't. Okay? It isn't. In the kingdom of heaven, Jesus sits on the throne. There's only one law, the law of love, and that is not compelled by force. It's just written on your hearts. So therefore, what we learned from our lesson today is that Jesus was not an anarchist. He didn't come to destroy society. He was not a revolutionary. He doesn't give a crap about our governments in this country, in this world. Doesn't care. I don't care. You want to know, you want to know who Jesus once elected for uh, president this year? Doesn't care. Doesn't care because that's not God's person, whoever it is. Okay? They're not representing God. Jesus was a transformer who takes the resources available and reveals their true, true potential. What do I mean by that? This is what Jesus wants to do. Jesus looks at you. Okay, now I am pointing at you down here. And you all. Pointing at you all. And you. And you all. And you all. Jesus looks at you and says, oh my goodness, look at the potential. And you guys are tearing yourselves down. We all do that sometimes. God is looking at every single one of you and seeing the great potential that you all have and saying, I can do something with this. That's what Jesus does. Okay? That's what Jesus does. And that's what the leper who came back and said, thank you, God, and understood. That's why he was truly healed. Number three, that we should respond to God's grace and goodness and gifts with gratitude. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is the biggest thing that keeps us from being healed. You know what it is? It's called bitterness. It keeps us from receiving the healing of God. One cannot be both bitter and grateful. One cannot be both bitter and healed from God. You know what bitterness is? I'll tell you what bitterness is. Bitterness is you being hurt. Somebody hurt you. Somebody said something nasty to you. A family member offended you. And you're still rehearsing that thing that that person did to you year after year after year after year. Are you holding on to things that people did to you five years ago, ten years ago? It is way past its, its uh, expiration date. You've got to let that go. Because it is killing you. The person who hurt you doesn't give a crap about you. Why are you letting them dominate your life? Bitterness is going to destroy you. And it is not of God. That is one of the burdens that God wants us to let go of. So if you're still rehearsing a wound that was done to you 10 years ago by somebody, or perpetrated against you, you are a bitter person, 
You will never receive a full healing of God until you can let go of that bitterness. Bitterness and gratitude are not companions. They can't go together. You want healing? Let go of the bitterness in your life. One cannot have a spirit of entitlement and be grateful. What do I mean by that? Do you think the world owes you? Oh, I got cancer. You know, I know a lot of people with cancer, and people respond a couple of different ways. People respond, with, why me? Or the other people say, oh, I'm so grateful for the life I've had. I've got a woman, 88-year-old uh, Japanese woman, uh, Mrs. Beale, who moved to this country. She's very grateful for the life that she had. She knows she's going to die. She has cancer. I just saw her the other day. But she's grateful for every day she's had. She's not saying, why me? Why now? It just is. She's grateful. Because she knows she's not owed another day. You are not owed another day. You're not owed another heartbeat. You're not owed another breath. But if God gives them, gives them to you another day, thanks be to God. Right? You can't live with an entitlement attitude and be grateful. You're not owed anything by anybody. It is all a gift. So Jesus still cures. I tell you, that's the great news about Jesus. Even if you have a lack of gratitude in your life, Jesus is still going to cure you. But just won't be able to heal you until you let go of that entitlement attitude and that bitterness in your life. If we want true healing, if we want true, deeper relationship with God, it is ultimately our attitude, not our bodies, that need to be changed if we are to receive this healing. Oh, I'm excited about that. I, could, I hope you guys are too. That's God speaking to me, and I'm just hoping God spoke to you through that today too. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you want to just touch us and heal us, but it is our bitterness and our entitlement attitude as though we're owed everything in life that is keeping us from being grateful and receiving the healing of God. Help us to be like that Samaritan who looks and says, Oh my gosh, I've been cured. I've been healed. I need to say thank you. That's when we know, God, that we've been truly healed. When we are able to look at our lives and be grateful for what we've received from your hands. Grateful for every breath. Grateful for every heartbeat. Because we know that there's not a promise of it tomorrow. This is what you've given us today. This may be everything that we have. And so let us live in that spirit of gratitude today. For he asks us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.